Hey everyone, my name is Jack. Welcome back to the channel. I cover a variety of topics as they relate to real estate, investing, the markets, and pretty much everything as it has to do with personal finance. So if you like that sort of content, be sure to have a look around the channel. And if you like what you see, be sure to subscribe. But today I want to talk about why rent control is objectively a bad policy, despite its good intentions. And I want to go over the economics that drive this reasoning for as to why it doesn't work. I also want to use this as an opportunity to start a little series about economic concepts applied to popular policies, especially as they relate to real estate, since there's a lot of things that people don't really understand for as to how markets work and the incentives behind decisions that make these policies effective or ineffective. So if you guys like that idea and you like this episode, definitely let me know in the comments below and I'll definitely make more of these types of videos in future episodes. But if you hate economics like many of our policymakers today, then obviously let me know that as well and I will not do many more of these videos, if any at all. I'm actually gonna jump over to my computer right now and we can walk through some of the concepts behind why rent control doesn't work. And so you can also see it graphically since I think it's a lot easier to understand that way. Economists do love graphs after all, and they do do a pretty good job of keeping things easier to understand, and it's a lot more exciting than just me talking about it. In fact, just infinitely more exciting. I hope you share my excitement and you leave this video a like. Hello everyone, welcome back to my computer. So here we have a supply and demand graph. This is not unique to the housing market, but We'll pretend like this is solely for the housing market right now. Every market has a supply and demand graph. It may not look exactly like this, but this helps to visualize what happens when you enact certain policies and when certain things happen in markets. And this intersection between supply and demand is what we like to call the equilibrium point. And at the equilibrium point, there's an efficient price, P1, and an efficient quantity, Q1. So the quantity here, the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded are the same and the price is determined by that quantity here. So this is what an efficient market would theoretically look like. It may change depending on the market. These supply and demand lines are shifting all the time because of a variety of things, maybe growth, maybe policies. These things do not stay the same, but markets are always trying to get to that equilibrium point. That's where everyone would cooperate the best essentially. Now this is what a growing city would look like. You'd have demand shifting outward because more people are wanting to move into a city. Maybe people have more income and they can afford more housing. This could be through something like a voucher program as well that gives people money to pay for housing. That actually shifts demand outwards. And when that happens, what happens to the price? This price goes up. P1 goes up to P2. The price of housing goes up as more people want it because the supply hasn't changed in this graph. So because of that, you have the more people chasing the same number of supply, the same number of houses or, or rental units, whatever you want it to be. So when demand shifts out, you expect prices to increase as well, which makes sense. You got this, more people chasing the same supply. Now what happens when you increase supply? This is what it looks like on this same graph. You have supply actually shifting outward, which is a downward motion in this case. And that happens, you have more supply and the same number of renters or people buying houses or whatever it happens to be. And that means the price will actually go downwards because you have suppliers competing with each other to chase the same number of buyers or renters, whatever it is. And you have more quantity down here as well. And that's exactly what you want. You want, if you're going for affordable housing, that is, you want more suppliers to come into an area because that would mean that there's more suppliers competing against each other and pushing prices down on rent. And that's what happens here. You have price going down when supply increases. That's really how you increase the affordability of housing without destroying the market otherwise. You're doing this. You're encouraging supply. You encourage development. You uh, lower restrictions on zoning and allow people to build where they want to build. Maybe allow people to build accessory dwelling units in their, in their spaces. That's generally how you do it. It gets harder incre to increase supply in larger cities because there's generally less space to put stuff. That makes sense. So you got to get pretty creative for finding ways to create new supply in a big city. Some cities use things like tax increment financing, where they give a, a developer a kickback, basically, by deferring their taxes and or even just waiving taxes, depending on the development, to lower their development costs, to encourage development in their area. However, a lot of affordable housing policies do the exact opposite. Now, that brings me to rent control. So here's an example of rent control on this same graph. Notice how you have supply and demand with their same equilibrium point as originally shown. 
You have Q1 and P1. That's where the market wants to go. But all of a sudden, you throw this purple line here, this rent control barrier. This is the ceiling on prices. Prices for rents or whatever it is can't go higher than this point. That's what the government says. But that actually ignores the market's efficient point. So what you get is this weird undersupply issue. Notice how QS, quantity supplied, is much lower than quantity demanded. And they are both different from where the market should be, and that's the Q1 equilibrium point. So you have more people who want more housing, and you have less suppliers who are willing to give it. So you get this undersupply issue. Sure, prices might be lower, but there's less supply in general, which eliminates the point since you just have less housing. There's not as much supply coming in that the market would actually be able to support if you didn't have this artificial ceiling on prices. That's not how markets work. You can't just come in and say this is the price of something because prices aren't just determined arbitrarily, at least in an actual free market. They are determined based on what people will pay for things. And if you have people who will pay more than this arbitrary rent ceiling, then suppliers will supply it. But if they can't supply more than that, or if they can't charge more than that for rent, what's the incentive for them to come in there and create new supply or to provide current supply or to upgrade their current supply? There is none, or at least it's severely reduced. So you get this weird situation with the uh, quantity supplied not equaling quantity demanded, and quantity demanded uh, actually far exceeds quantity supplied. So it's very inefficient when you look at different types of housing policies. So rather than actually encouraging development and creating new supply and creating new competition between suppliers, all you do is discourage competition and you just have this existing inventory that often falls into dilapidation. And that's exactly what we've seen in places like New York and San Francisco that are starving for supply right now. But because of rent control and, and arbitrary policies like that, you get this result where there's no supply coming into try and actually push prices down because suppliers can't charge as much as they would need to or would want to because there's other markets out there that don't have rent control. Perhaps if every single market on on planet Earth had rent control, maybe you'd have uh, developers who would still develop anyways because there's no other place to try and make a bigger return. But right now, there's tons of markets that are doing great that don't have rent control, so develop, developers will just take their business elsewhere. Why would you stay in a market that has rent control if you can move elsewhere? And that's certainly what big developers are doing. Smaller mom and pop type developers, which are very rare, um, they probably will still build their supply, but that's on a much smaller scale. When you really want to bring a large affordable influx of units, you probably need many, many units being made at once, and that's what the big institutional players do. And they're not coming to cities with rent control in many cases, unless they get some sort of exception or some sort of kickback to make up for it. And you can actually kind of see that in this graph I found of uh, San Francisco housing trends. Um, now, this is single family homes, so I, I don't know how correlated this is to like apartments that would definitely have rent control issues. Um, but rent control in San Fran got passed, I think, in the 70s. I forget what year exactly. But you can see a, a significant drop off. It was already on the decline, but you could see this big drop in the 80s, like a fairly noticeable drop. Um, which would be unusual for real estate since we had all that stagflation in the 70s. So if anything, I'd kind of expect an uptick just because debt would be in, an attractive option. Though I don't know, there was a lot of problems in the 80s with uh, kind of the bubble coming back down to earth with asset prices because we had Paul Volcker come in and he raised interest rates a ton to try and curb inflation. So that could be part of this. But in the 90s, same thing. It still was way lower and never recovered. We had the 2000s housing bubble, so that's a little misleading. Everything was out of control. And here you're probably not building places to try and actually rent them out. You're building them to get asset appreci appreciation, which is exactly what was happening in the 2000s. And then obviously the 2010s have been super low. Meanwhile, demand in San Francisco is enormous. Rents have skyrocketed in the areas that aren't controlled by rent control, but those that are have no way, have no incentive to actually build new supply in them. This is a bit of a correlation since it's single family homes, it looks like, but I thought I'd at least bring this to your attention because it's been very bad in New York and San Francisco that despite having rent control, have huge problems with expensive units and out of control expenses because there's no way to actually build new units in San Francisco and there's less incentive because of rent control. Same thing with New York and other markets that have this. And they've had this for a long time as well, yet rent is still a very massive expense with no downward force on it because it's so hard to build new units and the incentives just simply aren't there compared to other markets.
So if there's one thing you get out of this, I hope you just can picture this graph in your head. If you're ever thinking about rent control or if you're thinking about supporting or if you're trying to argue against it, this is really what it does. Uh, maybe you still think it's a great idea, but just note that it's incredibly inefficient. I personally don't think it's a good idea because it doesn't do what it sets out to do, which is make things more affordable. It does the opposite, if anything. It lowers prices in some areas, but then you have more demand and more people are upset because they can't get this new fakely affordable housing. And then there's no suppliers coming in, which actually does the good thing which is create new supply, which makes things more affordable because of competition, you lose that because the incentive's not there to actually build new units because you have a massive over-demand undersupply issue already. And there's no way for suppliers to get above that because there's this legal price ceiling on things, so they'd have to get some sort of exception. And I, and I bet in the markets that have exceptions, the areas that do have those exceptions are probably doing fine, but the areas that don't have exceptions are doing terrible. And you get a lot of workarounds through things like people converting apartments into condo complexes and then selling the condos to get, get their money that way because it does it's just not worth it keeping an apartment that has rent control on it because you can't raise rents and there's no incentive to actually improve the units. And New York actually just put a tried to put a stop to that by passing a law, I think it was a year ago, to try and stop people from converting apartments into condos without approval from all of their tenants. They're, they obviously see that this is a big workaround with rent, rent control for landlords and they want to try to stop them. But ultimately, that's really not how the housing market works. So anyways, that's why rent control really doesn't work. It mixes up the incentives in trying to create a good outcome. Rather than focusing on creating new supply, it actually discourages creating supply. And that's because suppliers have less of an incentive to actually create new supply. Meanwhile, you have renters who want even more of this cheap supply. So it's this weird, awkward situation where you have suppliers who don't want to come to the market and you have lots of renters who do. So you get this really just unsatisfying situation for everyone. Or an economist speak, it is very inefficient. Again, if you guys like this sort of video and you like the idea of going through the concepts behind an economic policy, I'd love to make more of these videos if you guys want to see them. So definitely let me know in the comments below and leave a like if you did, in fact, like this video. And another reminder to check out my new book that's releasing on Friday, August 28th, The One Property Retirement. Definitely great if you're at all interested in real estate or maybe you don't know a lot about real estate and want to learn about a simple strategy for building your retirement nest egg. I actually recently made a video going over one of the examples that I use in the book showing what a very simple, straightforward, break-even real estate deal can net you over the long term upwards of 60% returns, assuming very minimal appreciation. So definitely check out that video if you want to learn more about the power of long-term buy and hold real estate investing, even with just one deal. The book goes through things step by step and how to get started with investing in one property to build the backbone of your retirement. So you guys can definitely check that out. I'll leave a link in the description below. If you're seeing this after it's been released, the link will be there to actually purchase the book if you want to check it out. Again, that's August 28th of 2020. The One Property Retirement will be released and you can enjoy that book. And I'd love to get your feedback on Amazon. If you guys leave reviews, that would be great since that will help me to get this book out to more people, which is always a good thing. I'd very much appreciate your support as always. But until next time, take care.